Roberts, Extension Entomologist, and uh, we'll shift gears just a little bit and, and focus more on pests. Um, one of the first things I want to say is, is something I think we always need to be reminded of in Georgia. When we think about insect, insect pests and insect pest management, we've got a pretty good situation in the state of Georgia compared to other parts of the country. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think we still stay so competitive within the cotton industry. Just as an example, most years we're going to average spray an insect somewhere between two and three times. You know, some field, we still grow some fields that are sprayed zero times, and other situations we may be spraying four and five times. But again, we've got a, a good situation. Eradication of the boll weevil has meant so much to us. Jason, that's really allowed us to practice IPM and practice conservation of beneficials by removing those sprays. And again, this is so important. The more you can know about insects, the more knowledge you have, the better decisions you can make. It's as simple as that, and that's true with any segment of your operation on the farm. One of the things I've really tried to uh, get across to growers the last few years is, you know, we're spraying cotton two or three times. That doesn't make it any easier. Sometimes, in my opinion, when you spray cotton twice a year, that's harder as a decision maker than if you're spraying eight or nine times like they do in parts of the country. You know, we've got a lot riding on these sprays. They've got to be timed. We get a lot of return, a lot of protection from those investments. But when we make these sprays, I really like us to think about how we're affecting the big picture, how we're affecting the system. You know, when we're focusing in and going after stink bugs, let's make sure we don't make a decision that creates a problem with corn earworm, or creates a problem with mites or white flies. Let's try to manage that risk. And, and we'll, we talk about that at our county meetings and whatnot. In terms of insect pest management, best dollar you can spend is hiring a good scout, hire a good consultant. Again, we've got to know what's in the field. We've got good thresholds established for most of our pests. Stink bugs is an example. I have more confidence in thresholds of when to treat stink bugs. We've got more research to back up our recommendations than any other pest we deal with in cotton. But hire yourself a good scout. Uh, best dollar you can spend. Now I'm going to spend most of my time talking about thrips, but very briefly I want to mention pollinators. Uh, all of you all or aware of issues going on with pollinators, right? But one of the things I, I want to share with you today, there's a group of individuals with the University of Georgia, and we had some assistance with a couple of folks from the Department of Ag, but we've developed a publication, and I've got a box up here, you can get one on your way out. It's a plan for things we can do to help protect pollinators and even enhance pollinators in the state of Georgia. So it's a pollinator protection plan. Within this plan, there's actually information in there for beekeepers. There's information in there for pesticide users like us. There's information in here for homeowners, folks in urban Atlanta. There's information in here for landowners who want to do something good for pollinators. But what this book entails primarily is a lot of common sense, okay? Now, we saw input from a lot of stakeholder groups like the Cotton Commission like the Fruit and Vegetable Commission, Corn Commission, all the various commodity commissions, all the grower groups, George Organics, of course the beekeepers. So we came to a consensus as a state, and what this plan represents is we as a state in Georgia are trying to do something collectively coordinated to, to help pollinators. We're hopeful that we'll have an impact, okay? but. Uh, so get one of these, and uh, hopefully it's going to be positive for us uh, within agriculture, but positive for pollinators themselves. A lot of fingers are pointed at agriculture, but it's not just agriculture. But there are things we can do. And I don't want to spend much time on this, but who knows when bees are most active or pollinators are most active in a field or what time of day? They're most active in the morning. In the morning. All right, so if we're going to make an application of insecticides, it makes sense if we want to try to conserve pollinators, let's don't try to, let's try to avoid spraying in the morning. Now you as a decision maker have a lot of things to balance. You know, in the afternoons we tend to get thunderstorms popping up and that's a good thing. So, so again, what's in here is a, a collective set 
uh, of suggestions to help you conserve pollinators. But this is an important issue, okay? And uh, one of the things I stress to folks, if you grow a crop that has a flower, and you industry folks can back me up on this, but if it has a flower, this is gonna affect us, all right? It's not just a watermelon grower who has pollinators in his field. <clears throat> if that crop has a flower, like cotton does, this issue can come, come back and be, be important to us. Any question on that? All right, so uh, again, that's a collective effort where we try to bring a large group of folks together. Looks like I have just like a couple minutes left. So I'm gonna skip over some things, but I wanna make a few comments about thrips. Most common question I've got the last few years is our seed treatments working. Basically, we're using neonic seed treatments on most of the acres we plant. Uh, we've got other options like liquid in furrows, but when we talk about neonic seed treatments, are they working? Now, I tell you they are. This is a picture from a trial we had this past year. The row on the left is true untreated cotton. The row on the right, I'm not sure if that was gaucho, air, subdicta, doesn't matter. That's my 945, meaning, meaning I'm done, but uh, we're going to do two more minutes. But these seed treatments are working, okay? They're not perfect. We've got to supplement them, and I want to share with you just a little bit about environments where we're going to most likely need to spray them. On the farm, we or you don't have the opportunity to see untreated cotton like we did years ago. Um, when we were using Timic, what would invariably happen a time or a couple times a year? We would stop up that Timic tube. You guys remember seeing that row that looked like this, a little twig. You know, and a lot of times farmers got creative and ran a four-wheeler over that road or something just to try to protect the cotton. But we don't see that on the farm. But the point I really want to drive home is there's still value with these products, a lot of value on cotton. A couple take-home messages. You've got to have good protection early. You cannot allow one-leaf cotton to get banged up from threats. That's economic damage. Another take-home message. A rapidly growing seedling can better tolerate thrips injury. Another way to look at that is if you have a seedling that's not growing, you better make sure you're controlling thrips because that's when they can really punish you in terms of yield potential. You with me? Liquids. Most of our growers have used them for our seed treatments, but uh, we have a new product. If you're in the uh, plant path section, Bob Kimrate talked a lot about vellum total. And it's used as an amaticide. The vellum total contains the insecticide imidacloprid, which is the similar insecticide that's on our seed treatments. The gaucho and eris is also imidacloprid. But if we can apply that in the furrow, and uh, when we're looking at these higher rates of imidacloprid, the performance is better than what we see with the seed treatment. Okay? We also have the ability to use orthane. But one of the things orthane does not bring to the table at planting is it has no aphid activity. And again, we don't see untreated cotton on the farm, but in our plots, we can see aphids get on two-leaf cotton. And that's a different ball game than what we're accustomed to seeing aphids on square or blooming cotton. We're going to have to protect that cotton. We'll kind of cut it off right here, but one of the things you need to be aware of so the last two years, we've been monitoring susceptibility of thrips in the state of Georgia and across the southeast. And one of the things that is occurring is that we're seeing a lot of variability in the susceptibility to insecticides. And another way to say that is we're starting to see the development of resistance in thrips populations to the neonicotinoid insecticides. Actually, in Georgia, we've got data from eight sites Four of those sites are classified as resistant in a lab bioassay. Bio but what's important for us in, on the farm is that we're still, still seeing activity on the farm, okay? So we still need to be using these products. Um, an important point uh, to, to, to make to you, and then we'll stop the questions. When we think of the neonicotinoid seed treatments, there are two different seed treatments, two different insecticides that are available. One is a metacloprid, that's the bare product. 
in the gaucho and eris. The other is thymethoxam, which is a syngenta product in either cruiser or victa. For years, we always said these products perform very similar. But I can tell you, imidacloprid for the last two years has been much more consistent than thymethoxam. Okay? So in the field, this one is performing much more consistently than the thymethoxam product. With that, uh, we're out of time, but we would like to thank you as growers and what you do for us through the Cotton Commission. Uh, a lot of what we do to really help with questions that you have on the farm, we're able to do with the funding uh, we receive from the Cotton Commission, so we appreciate that. All right, we've got one minute left. And, uh, <coughs> We do have pesticide credits. I'm going to have them up here in the front. Green is commercial, white is private. But do we have any questions, even if it's something we didn't cover? Um, now's the time to, to ask them. Any comments or questions? You need to study up on this thrips thing. We need to, to be on the ball there. In terms of the insect problems we deal with on cotton right now, that's the one where we probably have the most opportunity to make sure we preserve the yield that's available to us. All right? If you have to do over the top treatment, If you have to do over the top treatment, we recommend three different products. We recommend acetate, dimethylate, or bidrin. Uh, I consider our standard to be orthene or acetate. Uh, it's probably the most active of those three products, but one of the reasons we use a lot of acetate is a lot of times these are going out with post herbicides and it's least likely to, to enhance injury there. But orthanes are our standard product there. There's another product, Radiant, and I had a little data slide in there. It looks, looks well, but you know, for the dollar, at least in the state of Georgia, a pound of orthane on five acres still does what we need it to do. Now, if you go up into the Carolinas, that has changed a little bit. They're, they're having to run a half pound. But, but orthene is, is our standard, and, and there's no reason to, to not use it, in my opinion. Any other comments? <coughs> is, it, is it acetate one of the worst things you spray around bees? Acetate's an insecticide. It's a contact insecticide, so if a bee comes in contact, it's probably not very good. You know, a lot of insecticides we use, I mean, a bee's insect, you know. Um, so what we've got to do is try to make applications, you know, when we're trying to conserve <coughs> pollinators. The reason I was asking, I know several farmers that like that the beehives. Well, there are a lot of insecticides that are, that are pretty toxic to bees. Pyrethroids, we think about, they, they have a, you know, any contact insecticide. But when we're spraying thrips, I would say bee activity in a cotton field is very, very slim. Most of the time when you're going to have bees foraging is when we're blooming on any crop for the most part. Mm -hmm.